This is Lesson 26.1, Uncertainty in Modern Thought. How did intellectual developments reflect the general crisis in Western thought? College Board Topic 7.5, The Age of Progress and Modernity. Explain how science and other intellectual disciplines developed and changed throughout the period from 1815 to 1914. And we're actually going to go way beyond 1914 in this particular lesson. Positivism, or the philosophy that science alone provides knowledge, emphasized the rational and scientific analysis of nature and human affairs. In the later 19th century, a new relativism in values and the loss of confidence in the objectivity of knowledge led to modernism in intellectual and cultural life. Philosophy largely moved from rational interpretations of nature and human society to an emphasis on irrationality and impulse, a view that contributed to the belief that conflict and struggle led to progress. Freudian psychology offered a new account of human nature that emphasized the role of the irrational and the struggle between the conscious and the subconscious. Developments in the natural sciences such as quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of relativity undermined the primacy of Newtonian physics as an objective description of nature. We also have College Board Topic 8.1, Contextualizing 20th Century Global Conflicts. Explain the context in which global conflict developed in the 20th century. During the 20th century, diverse intellectual and cultural movements questioned the existence of objective knowledge, the ability of reason to arrive at truth, and the role of religion in determining moral standards. Science and technology yielded impressive material benefits but also caused immense destruction and posed challenges to objective knowledge. College Board Topic 8.10 20th Century Cultural, Intellectual, and Artistic Developments Explain how the events of the first half of the 20th century challenged existing social, cultural, and intellectual understandings. Widely held belief in progress, characteristic of much of 19th century thought, began to break down before World War I. When World War I began, Europeans were generally confident in the ability of science and technology to address human needs and problems despite the uncertainty created by new scientific theories and psychology. The challenge to the certainties of the Newtonian universe in physics opened the door to uncertainty in other fields by undermining faith in objective knowledge while also providing the knowledge necessary for the development of nuclear weapons and power. The place is Europe, and the time frame is 1880 all the way to about 1940, give or take a few years either way. Key people in uncertainty in modern thought. Friedrich Nietzsche, Albert Einstein, Jean-Paul Sartre, Soren Kierkegaard, Marie Curie, Sigmund Freud, Sir William Mitchell Ramsey. Key concepts of uncertainty in modern thought. The Übermensch. Logical positivism, existentialism, quantum mechanics, psychoanalysis, nihilism, and E equals MC squared. Intro. The 1880s to the 1930s was a time of intense cultural and intellectual experimentation. People grappled with the costs of war and recovery. Philosophers and scientists questioned and often abandoned traditional wisdom the Enlightenment, industry and science, rational thought. Some embraced Christianity, others rejected Christianity. These trends do not lend themselves to exact dates. Modern philosophy. Before 1914, people believed in Enlightenment ideals, progress, reason, individual rights. And there were reasons for optimism. Women and workers were getting more political and social recognition. The standard of living was going up. Cities were being tamed. And there were more state-supported social programs. However, critics were already attacking these beliefs. The most famous example is Friedrich Nietzsche. He lived from 1844 to 1900. He was the son of a Lutheran minister. He was virtually unknown during his lifetime. And in 1889, he suffered a complete mental breakdown from which he never recovered. After a series of strokes, he died of pneumonia in 1900. 
His sister edited and published some of his manuscripts, obscuring their true intent. Friedrich Nietzsche's message. He wrote, not scientifically, but poetically. He claimed that the West overemphasized rationality, which stifled human expression. Human activity and creativity were driven by authentic passions and instincts that rationality hindered. Reason, progress, and respectability were outworn human constructs, and these things drained out human self-realization and human excellence. Nietzsche's work is very open to interpretation. Scholars disagree about many of his concepts. After he became mentally disabled, his unpublished works were compiled, edited, and published outside of his control. And there's debate about whether or not he was starting to lose his mind even before his mental breakdown. He attacked institutionalized Christianity. He himself was not necessarily an atheist. He claimed that Christianity did not properly present the teachings of Jesus. He claimed that modern Christianity promoted a slave morality. That's not slave mentality, but a slave morality. This was one of Nietzsche's central themes. What is a slave morality? The slave morality is a morality of resentment that the weak have against the strong. The slave morality is designed to undermine the values and beliefs of those who are strong. Liberalism, democracy, and socialism are all deceptive lies produced by the slave morality to subvert the master morality. He's most famous for writing these immortal words, God is dead. His statement is often interpreted as a denial of the existence of God. However, these words were actually said by a character in one of his books, not by Nietzsche speaking as himself. The book was called The Gay Science from 1882, and the character's name was simply The Madman. And what he really meant by this was that modern Christians no longer believed in God. This was because of recent developments in science, and it was also due to increasing secularism in Europe. The result of all this was the ideology known as nihilism. If God is dead, then we no longer exist. And if we no longer exist, then things like actions, truth, purpose, suffering, willpower, and feeling have no real meaning. If you have the moral strength to accept that there is no inherent meaning in this life, you might be able to define your own meaning. And then you might become what Nietzsche called an Übermensch. And this can mean Superman or Overman or Beyond Man. As an Übermensch, you're free to define and impose your own values on this world for yourself. Henri Bergson 1859 to 1941, he said that experience and intuition were just as important as rationale and scientific reasoning. If a religious experience or a mystical poem is more easily understood by you than a scientific law or a math equation, isn't that more important? Logical positivism. Only talk about things you can demonstrate to be valid. This was a worldview that dominated in English-speaking countries and still does today. Its most famous proponent was Austrian Ludwig Wittgenstein. He immigrated to England. He wrote an essay on logical philosophy in 1922. Ludwig Wittgenstein said that there are many philosophical issues that you simply cannot demonstrate to be valid through science or math, things like God, freedom, morality, etc., and therefore, any statements you make on these subjects are merely personal preference. And therefore, the best thing to do is simply not discuss these things. As a result, logical positivism drastically reduced the scope of philosophical inquiry. Very importantly, Ludwig Wittgenstein saw philosophy as being rooted in language. Philosophy is the clarification of thoughts. Thoughts are expressed in language. And therefore, philosophers need to spend a lot more time studying language. Existentialism. To understand existentialism, we first need to understand its inverse, essentialism. 
Everything and everyone has existence, and everything and everyone has an essence. When we talk about something's essence, we mean what are its basic qualities and characteristics? What defines it? What makes it what it is? What is its purpose and its function? Think about a chair. There are hundreds of different kinds of chairs. Many of them look very different from each other. But you still have a really good idea of what makes a chair a chair. You can easily tell whether an object is or is not a chair because you understand the essence of chairness. Many ancient philosophers believed that your essence existed before you yourself existed. So your qualities, your meaning, and your purpose have already been predetermined for you, including such things as your gifts, your capacities, your limitations, the things you are not meant to do or be. They're predetermined by God, the universe, your parents, gender, race, birthplace. In the movie Rocket Man, a character said the line on the image to the right. You've got to kill the person you were born to be in order to become the person you want to be. That's existentialism if by kill you mean to rid your mind of essentialism and essentialist biases. Existentialism says you existed first before your essence. Your essence was determined later, over time, primarily by you yourself. You can't blame others for what they told you because you chose to accept it. So you are 100% responsible for determining your own essence. Jean-Paul Sartre. He was French and he lived from 1905 to 1980. He was a main proponent of existentialism. He wrote plays and novels. He was short and not very attractive. Some might have said that that was Sartre's essence. In 1943, he wrote a book called Being and Nothingness. Existentialism has some downsides. Such things as your destiny or your fate are out of the picture. The idea that you were predestined to accomplish some really important thing in some really important cosmic plan is out the window. There's nobody out there creating momentous, epic things for us to accomplish. And that means that at the end of the day, nothing you do is really all that important. This whole universe and existence itself was created for no reason at all. It serves no higher purpose other than to simply exist. Existentialists have a word for this kind of existence. Absurd. So the universe is a world without reason, meaning, justice, goodness, badness, rules, or order. If you're looking for meaning in this world, you're not going to find what isn't out there. That would be absurd. The World Wars gave existentialism a boost. You can easily see why the senseless death, suffering, and cruelty of the two world wars made existentialism popular. Existentialism offered an answer to the question, how could these horrific things happen? The existentialist answer was that they happened because they could happen. And that's all there was to it. There was no higher moral power to stop it. Existentialism and Freedom In the existentialist worldview, you have complete freedom to make yourself and your world your own. That is the greatest impact you can have on the world. There are no rules you absolutely have to follow. Jean-Paul Sartre believed that this was actually a source of anguish and fear for most people. He referred to this state of being as condemned to be free. There's safety and security and rules and boundaries. But that safety is a sweet lie because there really are no rules. People who make rules are just as lost and clueless as you are. Existentialism and the responsibility for complete freedom. People don't want to accept responsibility for the freedom that they have in this absurd world. So we willfully see order where there is none. 
Sartre called this abdication of our responsibilities bad faith. We lie to ourselves about our freedom all the time in order to avoid pain. We believe certain things just because it's easier to. We believe things are the way they are because they have to be and that there are no other options. The most destructive example of bad faith is when we choose to believe that we are trapped in our present circumstances. Existentialism and Living Authentically Jean-Paul Sartre believed that your main goal in life should be to discover for yourself your purpose and your meaning based upon your values and your choices alone. One of Sartre's most famous quotes is, Hell is other people. And what he meant by that was that concern with the opinions and judgments of others can only limit you because you'll try to win their approval and thus be distracted from your own personal freedom. Sartre called this living authentically. When you live authentically, no one can tell you with any credibility that you're wasting your life. Their value judgments are not valid for you and don't count. The Revival of Christianity Before 1914, the prevailing wisdom was, if it's science, it's true, and if it's not science, it's silly. In the Victorian era, it was considered fashionable to dismiss religion. It was unscientific. It was irrational. It was inaccurate. Academic circles and universities taught students to doubt scripture. The Old Testament was considered inaccurate because nobody had found any evidence of the Hittites. The Old Testament was considered inaccurate because nobody had found any evidence that Nebuchadnezzar had existed. Now today we would say, of course there were a people called the Hittites. Of course Nebuchadnezzar was a real person. Academic circles tend to be very forgiving of themselves when they are proven wrong. Evangelical preachers were often intimidated by the, quote, scholarly arguments. They often adjusted their own understanding of the gospel accordingly. Jesus was just a great teacher and a good man and nothing else. He got his ideas from Buddhism and Zoroastrianism, etc. He never intended to be viewed as God or a savior. He couldn't read or write. His resurrection was meant to be understood as a spiritual one rather than a physical one. And supposed miracles had rational explanations. Noah's Ark, Jonah and the Whale, the parting of the Red Sea. Satan, he's a personification of evil. And the Bible is full of errors and contradictions. It's changed a lot over time. We can't really know its original form. And the average person isn't really capable of understanding it. After 1914, there was a large Christian revival in Europe. Archaeological discoveries seemed to verify an unexpectedly large amount of scripture. But the even bigger reason was World War I. The more fundamental beliefs of Christianity became cool again. Man's sinful nature, faith, mystery, grace, and the gospel. Soren Kierkegaard became popular again. And he lived from 1813 to 1855, so he was quite early. He was Danish. He viewed science as too limited to prove or disprove the existence of God. Instead, belief in God required what he termed a leap of faith. When you look at these Kierkegaard quotes, you can see why he's known as the father of existentialism. He previewed many of the concepts that atheists like Sartre and Albert Camus became famous for. Karl Barth, 1886-1968. He was Swiss and he emphasized that humans were imperfect and sinful. Human will and human reason were both very flawed. And therefore, a man cannot use reason to know God. His reason is too flawed. Only grace could allow people to know God. Knowledge of God was a matter of two things, acceptance of God's word and awe, trust, and obedience. Gabriel Marcel and Jacques Maritain, these were French Catholics, and they denounced anti-Semitism 
they encouraged more contact with non-Catholics. Intellectual Christians Between 1920 and 1950, many intellectuals were attracted to Christianity. Poets like T.S. Eliot and W.H. Auden, novelists like Graham Greene, Evelyn Waugh, and Aldous Huxley, and historians like Sir William Mitchell Ramsey and Arnold Toynbee. Writer C.S. Lewis started out as an atheist and wanted to stay that way. He didn't want to become a Christian, but he decided the facts dictated that, in his words, God was God. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, and these stories are full of Christian symbolism. For example, the lion Aslan is obviously Jesus. He also wrote Christian science fiction, and he wrote prolifically about Christianity including the book Mere Christianity, which was a collection of radio transcripts that he had made about Christianity, and the screw tape letters. One of the most famous arguments that came out of Mere Christianity was the three L's argument that C.S. Lewis was known for. And he wasn't necessarily trying to tell us which L to believe in, although it was clear which one he believed in. His main purpose was to undermine the popular Victorian scholarly idea that Jesus was just a good man and a gifted teacher who was killed by the Romans for political reasons. And the three L's stood for liar, lunatic, or lord. In other words, you could use scripture to say, look at what a liar he was with all those things that he said about himself. What a fraud. What a con man. Or you could use scripture to say he was a lunatic. Look at all those crazy things that he said about himself. What a nut job. Or third, you could argue the third L, that he was Lord. In other words, he wasn't a liar. He wasn't a lunatic. He was who he said he was, and he did the things that he said he was going to do. Lewis's main point was this. You can pick any of these three L's that you want to. But if you're going to try to argue this very popular Victorian image that Jesus was just a nice guy and a wise teacher who got caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, then scripture is not going to be of any use to you. You're going to either have to invalidate scripture directly, or you're going to have to try to deconstruct it. In other words, say, it doesn't mean what you think it means. You're just imposing your own cultural biases and your own desires onto the text. So as a result of people like C.S. Lewis, these more modern arguments have also entered the debate around Christianity's central figure. The premise of the screw tape letters is that there is a demon who has been assigned to corrupt this Christian. And the screw tape letters are his reports to his superiors. And that book is hilarious. The New Physics Before 1895, physics was Newtonian physics. Science was thought of as based on hard facts. Science was the product of controlled, observable experiments. Science was practical and useful. Natural laws were absolute, universal, and dependable. Atoms were stable, indivisible, and were the basic building blocks of the universe. You couldn't divide matter down further than the atom. That's what made atoms atoms. Science had killed God, disproved the Bible, and defeated religion. After 1895, science began to cannibalize itself. The relatively new science of archaeology was making discoveries that were actually supporting biblical text rather than disproving biblical text. There really was a great civilization called the Hittites. There really was a Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar. Civilization was discovered to have had writing long before anyone had thought they did. We often think of science as religion's foe, but it often turns out to be its friend. Ironically, it's actually none other than science itself that has proven the Bible accurate on many occasions. The foundations of physics were challenged by a new kind of physics. We would eventually call it quantum physics or quantum mechanics. One of the things I want to do for you here is to establish a sequence rather than just a list of physicists and what they did. Röntgen, Becquerel, Curie, Planck, Einstein, Rutherford, and Heisenberg 
all built on the work of the people who came before in a sequential order that we can pretty easily follow. In 1895, Wilhelm Röntgen discovered these X-rays. The origin of these X-rays was unknown. Traditional physics had no explanation for these X-rays. In 1896, Henri Becquerel discovered that uranium emitted radiation. And this radiation didn't depend on an external energy source the way that phosphorescence did. Instead, this radiation seemed to come from the atom itself. Marie Curie was looking for a thesis for her PhD and decided to do it on this new thing called radiation. Marie Curie, 1867-1934, and her husband, physicist Pierre Curie, analyzed uranium. She did not think that the radiation was coming from any kind of molecular compound or chemical activity. Instead, the radiation seemed to come from the atom itself. Marie Curie and her husband coined the word radioactivity. They discovered two new elements, radium and polonium. Marie Curie discovered that radium constantly emits subatomic particles all the time. Max Planck, 1858-1947, he discovered that radium's atomic weight was not constant. Something within the atom was adding to it or subtracting from it. And he discovered that subatomic energy was coming from these atoms in spurts. Planck called these subatomic spurts of energy quanta. Could there be a connection between these two observations? Because of these two observations, Max Planck postulated that matter and energy were somehow related to each other. In so doing, Planck presented a view of the atom not as fixed and stable, but rather as in a constantly changing state of flux. Albert Einstein, 1879 to 1955, he's the quintessential genius. He came up with the theory of special relativity. For him, time and space are really just a matter of your point of view. We might travel to Mars at a certain speed, but what is that speed relative to the speed of the solar system or the galaxy or many galaxies? That's not very comforting if you are into traditional Newtonian physics and somebody comes along and says, no, it really all depends on your point of view. Einstein said that time and space were basically the same thing. We treat time and space as being the same thing all the time. We can say that Austin is 220 miles away from Richardson, or we can say that Austin is four and a half hours away from Richardson. Time and space are unified and made one by speed. And what is the one thing in the universe whose speed never varies? It's light. The speed of light is a universal constant. Einstein built upon Planck's postulation about the connection between matter and energy. Just as time and space were the same thing, matter and energy were the same thing. You can convert matter into energy. A tiny amount of matter contains a mind-boggling amount of energy. When you multiply its mass by the speed of light squared, if you were to create a reaction at the atomic level in which even a teeny tiny bit of matter was converted to energy, you would release an unbelievable amount of energy. Of course, you'd have to get deep inside that atom in order to do that. It wouldn't happen on a molecular or chemical level. Ernest Rutherford, 1871 to 1937. He showed that you could indeed manipulate atoms deep down. You could literally split an atom and turn that atom into two completely different atoms. And the slight difference in atomic mass between the atom you split and the two atoms you create will convert into an incredible amount of energy. And the acts for creating this split, 
for creating enough instability within that atom to cause it to split was a subatomic particle called the neutron. If you fire a neutron into the nucleus of uranium-235, it's going to create energy, which is going to excite that nucleus. From there, one of two things is going to happen with that energy, and you can't predict which will happen from one uranium-235 atom to the next. The nucleus might manage to absorb that neutron and become uranium-236 and get rid of that extra energy in the form of a gamma ray. But if that nucleus can't absorb that neutron and release that extra energy in the form of a gamma ray, it's going to have no choice but to split into two different elements of various possibilities, krypton and barium, or xenon and strontium, etc. Excess neutrons that couldn't find a spot on either of these two new atoms are going to go flying all over the place into other atoms, causing an instant chain reaction and eventually creating about 20 elements lighter than uranium. And a few of those neutrons are going to convert into pure energy. And that is your greatly oversimplified formula for nuclear energy. But if you want to enrich that uranium to the point where it's real pure, you've got yourself the original formula for an atomic bomb. Werner Heisenberg, 1901 to 1976. He's known as the father of quantum physics, also known as quantum mechanics. He formulated the uncertainty principle. Deep down, physics is really about probabilities and possibilities, not about certainties, not about absolutes, and not about physical laws. Anything can and will happen with some degree of frequency. It's from this aspect of quantum mechanics that we get all of our wonderful science fiction stories about alternate timelines and multiple universes. And therefore, the universe is unpredictable and unknowable. The universe has no objective no absolute reality to it. The traditional Newtonian physics, which we thought was so absolute and so reliable and so unassailable, no longer ruled the day. Freudian psychology. Before the 1880s, people felt that humans were rational, thinking, logical beings most of the time. Sigmund Freud, who lived from 1856 to 1939, was an Austrian neurologist. He was the founder of psychoanalysis. And he began treating patients with, quote, hysteria through dialogue between doctor and patient. Sigmund Freud began to develop techniques to access the feelings, desires, concepts, and beliefs that patients were not consciously aware of, but which were driving their behavior and all their decisions. Some examples of his techniques free association, interpreting patients' dreams as the fulfillment of deep desires, his iconic couch that he had his patients lie down on as he dialogued with them. Freud felt that exposing these deep mental and emotional factors was an essential step towards emotional healing. In 1900, Freud published The Interpretation of Dreams. He described the mind as having three structures. The first was the id. This was the unconscious part of your mind. It is absolutely necessary for survival. It controls a huge amount of your normal activities. All the thoughts and feelings that don't have our immediate attention are being processed by the id. If our minds were computers, the id would be like the hard drive, full of useful stuff, but also fragmented and full of junk. Our id contains and uses all of our memories, desires, emotions, concepts, beliefs, and perceptions. These drive our behavior and our decisions without our awareness. The interesting thing about the id is that it has no mechanism for judging any of our thoughts, desires, experiences, beliefs, or feelings. So it has no capacity to distinguish what is true or false real or imaginary, 
logical or illogical, right or wrong, fact or fiction, possible or impossible, past, present, or future. All of our subconscious experiences and beliefs are equally valid and credible to the subconscious part of our minds. Second, the superego. This is the repressive part of our minds. It's the part that criticizes us and inhibits us and shuts us down. It enforces arbitrary moral values given to us by our parents, upbringing, and society. It serves as a check on the impulsiveness of our id. If our minds were a computer, I don't know what the superego would be. Third, the ego is the part of our minds that we are most aware of. It's the judgment level of our minds. Unlike the id, the ego can only process one thought at a time. If our minds were a computer, this would be the RAM. And it is constantly exchanging information with the id and the superego. The relationship of the id, the ego, and the superego. I like to think of our minds as a courtroom. The id and the superego are both lawyers arguing their case before the judge. And your ego is the judge who evaluates the arguments of each lawyer and makes a decision based on the merits of each lawyer's argument. Freud believed that mental anguish was caused by an imbalance among these three levels of consciousness. In the year 1930, Sigmund Freud wrote a book called Civilization and Its Discontents. And in this book, Freud argued that the main problem people have is that their id is too repressed. He did not feel that Western civilization was equipped to help us free the id. And since that was the case, most people were doomed to suffer from unfulfilled subconscious desires.